We have Dr. Cynthia Capon, who's medical director of our uh, comprehensive eating disorders program here at Packard Children's. Uh, she's a clinical associate professor in the Division of Adolescent Medicine here at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Capon is a board certified pediatrician and adolescent med medicine specialist with over 14 years of clinical experience managing the medical aspects of eating disorders in adolescents. Her research and her advocacy um, focuses on ensuring that adolescents have access to appropriate medical and mental health services to meet their special needs. And she's the author of many articles that uh, relate to the health of adolescents. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be here with you today. Yeah. Eating disorders are serious and they're also potentially lethal. They have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness, up to 20%. And when you look at individuals age 15 to 24 and you compare women in this age group, there's a 12 times higher mortality rate for individuals who have eating disorders. There's also a very high rate of medical complications, both short-term and long-term, in teens that have eating disorders. There's really not any body system that is spared in an individual that's undernourished or engaging in unhealthy eating patterns. We see changes in the heart rate, in the blood pressure, in the temperature, and these are, are truly a sign of the malnutrition and can occur even in people that are normal weight or above weight. Sometimes if you have an individual who's lost a, a large amount of weight, they may be above weight but still have the same physiologic changes. I find it helpful to think about some of the changes that we see in eating disorders as a kind of hibernation response. Just like with bears when they're going into hibernation, they try to do as much as they can to conserve the energy that they've got if they're not going to be eating over a prolonged period of time. So there's a low heart rate, a low temperature, low blood pressure, and individuals that are having a mismatch in their, their nutritional needs and their nutritional intake have these same kind of changes as well. It's really the body shifting into survival mode. So the body wants to keep the brain going and the heart going. And everything extra, it's, it's not going to get the same attention. So other organs get neglected. It's, uh, Dr. Golden had talked about sort of the cool hands and feet. You know, they're kind of extra. If you don't have enough um, energy to keep your body going with the main organs, you're not going to bother with your extremities. And in particular, the thing that we get especially worried about with children and teens is growth and development becomes a luxury item if you don't have enough energy even just for basic survival. The heart is the organ that we get particularly concerned about because of the potential fatal complications that we can see with the heart. Uh, the low heart rate is not a sign of fitness. It's a sign of getting into that malnourished um, survival state. We can also see drops in blood pressure. When you go from lying to standing, you can have an increase in heart rate or a drop in blood pressure as well, showing that the heart's trying to, to deal with that stress of change in position. The abnormal heart rhythms that we can see with eating disorders can be potentially fa fatal, and we can also see heart failure as well with the malnutrition. The gastrointestinal complications that we see from malnutrition primarily involved a slowing of movement through the gut. So we see constipation. It's very common to see some bloating and abdominal discomfort. And in addition, the liver can be affected both from the process of starvation, but also when we try to refeed somebody as well, the liver can become stressed. The gastrointestinal complications that we see with bulimia can be potentially life-threatening. The stomach it produces a lot of acid, and the body's designed really well to keep acid where it belongs, which is in the stomach, and to have the mouth and the esophagus, the tube that goes from the mouth to the esophagus, it's not supposed to be exposed to acid at all. So when you have somebody that's, that's purging, the acid then comes in contact with tissue that's not designed to withstand that acid exposure. And so it can erode the tissue, you can have bleeding, you can have ulcers and tears or even rupture in that tissue. And also the mouth can be severely damaged by that, the teeth and then the parotid gland enlargement that Dr. Golden discussed. This is a picture on the left side of an individual that has tears, particularly that area where the esophagus and the stomach come together, it can get strained quite a bit from repeated vomiting, and you can get tears there. And the individual on the right side has actual tear through the esophagus. And these are some of the oral effects of the purging. Let's see if my little, oops, hang on a minute. Um, 
on the left side, the top one, you just start to see more of the tooth that's exposed as the enamel gets eroded. And on the bottom picture, it's a very severe case. The dark areas in the middle are fillings in the teeth, and then the area all around the teeth has become eroded because of the acid exposure. And that is the parotid gland enlargement. It's at the back of the jawline. You get some fullness there from repeated acid exposure and vomiting. Purging doesn't just get rid of food, though. It actually gets rid of chemicals that can be really important for the body. Potassium, in particular, can be lost when individuals are purging. And potassium is one of the main elements that lets the heart function. So when potassium gets low from repeated purging, the heart can stop beating, and you can get sudden death. In addition, phosphorus is very important. It can be lost through purging, but it can also become low in individuals who are malnourished. And when you have phosphorus is needed for all of the energy of the body. So the heart needs it, the brain, the muscles, everything. So when you have low phosphorus levels, all of the energy of the body can shut down and you can get sudden death from that as well. I put this up because I wanted to highlight for you the times in our um, childhood and adolescence when we have periods of major growth. The early toddler years are significant for gen general growth, and then things kind of level out for childhood. But then adolescent hits, and we have the second major growth spurt. So you have most of your genital development happening during adolescence, and you have a very significant amount of general growth going on as well. So these are the areas that are going to be particularly vulnerable when somebody's cutting back on nutrition. Nearly 25% of your final adult height occurs during puberty. The heart weight doubles during puberty. Bone mass increases by 45%. And body fat changes are actually quite important as well. Prepubertal, there's about a 16% average of body fat in girls, and that increases to a, an average of 27% in adults. And this is actually very important for normal hormonal uh, development and function. The brain has achieved most of its adult mass by early adolescence, but it continues to change in function over time. The effect on the hormones of the body or the chemical messengers can be really critical and have some very long-term changes for adolescents who experience nutritional difficulties. Eating disorders suppress the hormones that are needed for growth and development. In girls, we see ovarian shrinkage, and then there's also the loss of the menstrual periods. In boys, there's actual shrinkage of the testicles as well. And for boys, there's an associated loss of erections and wet dreams that they would have normally during puberty. The potential risk can be irreversible. The time during adolescence is critical for building up bone strength, and if you don't do that, you can have an adulthood that has very fragile bones. And in addition, individuals that have eating disorders early on can also not achieve their full adult height. About 40% of peak bone mass is accumulated during adolescence, and we, we consider it kind of a, a bone bank. During adolescence, you can put money in the bank, you can take money out of the bank. When you build your bones up with appropriate nutrition and normal hormonal functioning, you're putting money in the bank for the future. When you don't have the, the appropriate input or the hormones to, to channel that input in a correct way, then you might not have that, that bone bank balance built up the way it needs to be for the long run. 50% of eating disordered patients have a decrease in bone density. It can occur both in girls and in boys. And it also occurs in normal weight individuals who have disordered eating. And it's both from the inability to deposit the calcium, as well as a lot of times these individuals are, are failing to take in sufficient calcium as well. These are some x-rays. Uh, the one on your left is a normal x-ray, and you just see you've got that, that sort of white, and that's good. That's the calcium of the body. It's strong there. And the bone on the, the left side has a great dense architecture. Those are going to be strong bones. On the right side, that sort of skeletal picture is somebody that has severe osteopenia, osteoporosis from bone loss. And then that bone, as you can see on the right side, it's very fragile. It's not going to be a strong bone. It's going to be easily fractured. So pop quiz. What organ contains the highest percentage fat of the body? Shout it out. Brain. Yeah. Oh, you guys are so good. <laughs> Your brain, yes. Your brain is 60% fat.